pleasure being here. Um, thanks again uh, to Ray and Marta and Paul Messina and all those guys who invited me here. Um, so what I thought I'd do today, given that this is a dinner talk, and given I, I actually went to the website and I saw that you guys have a very full schedule, and on top of that, you're eating some really tasty food, I think we're going to keep it a little bit on the light side. This is more about kind of giving you an overview rather than getting into you just got, you heard Kathy Yellick's talk in the morning and you got all trained in OpenMP and you heard Jim talk about all linear algebra and everything, so you're not all experts in that. I hear that there is a final at the end of the two week period. So this is going to be a more of a you know, high level presentation. So, so what I thought uh, I'll tell you a little bit because this is about computational science. Um, tell you about how NASA uses, uh, you know, high performance computing or advanced computing um, uh, to do the kinds of things that NASA is interested in. So, so let's just um, start off first because I don't know how many of you know about NASA. Again, this is a DOE-led uh, effort. Many of you have already read out, read up a lot about DOE, but maybe just a quick overview of what NASA is or what we are you know, chartered to do would kind of give you a little um, uh, exposure or try to put everything in context. So, you know, NASA is a, is a civilian agency, um, directly reports to the executive branch of the federal government, and um, NASA's main goal is to improve things for humankind. Um, so almost everything that NASA does is in some sense unclassified work. It's just for betterment of everyone. But NASA is still organized as four mission directorates, and that's what we call. And just to give you a context of when we talk about high performance computing, it's important to realize these mission, what these mission directorates are. So obviously the first mission directorate is aeronautics. That's the first day in NASA. And the goal there is to kind of do advances in technology that improves, you know, civil aviation, it could be, you know, um, environmentally responsible aviation, you know, ATM, air traffic management. Now if you throw drones into the airspace, how does that all work? So that's the first A in NASA. And then of course we have human exploration and operations. That was basically the core of what NASA has been doing during the shuttle era. But right now that is focused on not only keeping station alive, but also to look at the next generation of rockets, which is the space launch system, and the multi-purpose crew vehicle, which is also known as Orion, that is going to take us places deep beyond moon. Um, the third major mission directorate is the science mission directorate, because you know, NASA being a space agency has a good view of Earth than any other ground-based agency, so do we do a lot of Earth sciences, but there's also you know, planetary sciences, astrophysics, heliophysics, all of those other areas of science are also code to what NASA does. And the newest mission directorate is the Space Technology Mission Directorate, and the goal of that mission directorate is to uh, do innovations in all kinds of technologies that assist the other three mission directorates. So NASA is a mission agency, and so NASA's main goals are to do what these mission directorates are expected to do. But NASA is also a distributed agency. So NASA is kind of distributed throughout the United States. NASA was created in 1958, but NASA actually started as NACA, and this was right at the start of the First World War, and NASA started off by the first center, which is NASA Langley Research Center in, in Virginia, and they just celebrated their 100 years. And then Ames Research Center, where I am from, on the West Coast, for a variety of reasons, NASA decided, or at that time, NACA decided to put their second center on the West Coast. So Ames just completed their 75th year. So we were founded in 1939, so we are coming up to like 80 years. And then the two other centers were formed shortly thereafter. Um, NASA Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, which is now known as Glenn Research Center, and Dryden Flight Research Center in the Mojave Desert, which is now called Armstrong Research Center. So those were the four research centers before NASA was created in 1958, and so these four centers are still called the aeronautic centers. And then the other centers came 
very quickly in rapid succession. Obviously, these are the centers that most of you know about. You know, Kennedy Space Center, Johnson, um, Marshall, all of these centers came after that. So in some sense, if you think of it, NASA has kind of a matrix organization. You have these mission directorates, and then you have these centers. Okay, and so now what is NASA supposed to do? So these are the six things that NASA is expected to do, okay? So the, for the budget that we get, which is about $19 billion a year, these are the six things that NASA is, is the focus areas. So the first one, like I said, focus on Earth. So a lot of work on Earth sciences, Earth observing satellites, all of that work is one of core parts of NASA. The second thing is off the Earth. So basically looking at station, we have these huge partnerships with commercial companies like SpaceX and Boeing for doing both crew and cargo to the station. Because right, right now NASA does not have a shuttle and in fact we transfer crew to the station using Soyuz with the Russians. Um, but one of the ideas is that these commercial companies are going to be able to do these kind of low Earth orbit missions. Point three, is, uh, the third focus area is beyond moon, so it's Mars and beyond, and both robotic and human missions. The fourth area is technology. All of the technologies that NASA need, not only for NASA missions, but must have trickle down effect on the betterment of humankind. Fifth area, obviously, is aeronautics. And as you can see, you know, aeronautics is growing faster throughout the world, maybe not so much in the Western world, but places like China, and in the Asian, and in Asia, those are the growth, big growth areas. And then finally, life detection. Are we alone? Is there any life anywhere else in the universe? Um, we have the Kepler mission, many of you might know about it, looking, like Earth, looking for Earth-like planets in an habitable zone that is just the right distance away from a star so that life could exist there. And given that Kepler has found so, so many planets, there is a strong belief that there could be more than one place other than Earth, which is in the habitable zone. So those are the main things that we are supposed to do. So then looking down a little bit more at my center, where I am, which is Ames Research Center. This is near San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, this is the second NASA center. Uh, so we have about more or less 3,000 employees. About a third of them are civil servants, people like us who actually work for the government, we are civil servants, and, and, and then we have about 2,000 other on-site employees who are contractors who come in on a daily basis to support the civil servants to do the work. And then we have students, uh, budget is slightly above $900 million a year. Uh, we have a lot of space, we have 2,000 acres of prime real estate in the Bay Area, and so a lot of that is also used for doing collaboration with other um, like-minded technology companies that would advance NASA's goal. So this is how AIMS is organized. And again, this is kind of a slightly long preamble to kind of get you to understand what NASA is and then why are we doing high-end computing? Because within NASA, high-end computing is slightly different than how it is within the DOE. So these are NASA's core, these are NASA AIMS's core competencies. These are the things, because one of the things that NASA headquarters has tried to do is to make sure that these nine centers that NASA has and JPL, which is the FFRDC, that these 10 sites work together to advance NASA's missions. So each center has some, what you would consider swim lanes that they are supposed to focus on. So these are the eight that Ames is focused on. And again, we are not going to talk about all of these, but if you think about them, they're not all at the same level. You know, you can think about air traffic management, you know, you have thermal protection systems, which is looking at entry systems. You have intelligent adaptive systems where we have a lot of work in autonomy and robotics and software VNV, uh, but also human factors, augmented virtual reality, internet of things. Then we have low cost space missions. Instead of doing these billion dollar space missions, can we do 80% of the science at 10% of the cost? 
Um, and then, of course, you have aero sciences. We talked about it. And then we have the sciences, which are astrobiology, life sciences, space and earth sciences. But then if you think about it, there's also advanced computing and IC systems, which you could consider a core competency, but it's also kind of an enabling thing for all of these other competencies. And one of the things that NASA has done um, over the past few years is also consolidated some of these capabilities at certain centers. So for example, NASA Ames is the lead center for high-end computing for the entire agency. So we therefore operate NASA's primary supercomputer, which then is used by NASA employees at other NASA centers or NASA partners at government, other government agencies or industry or in academic institutions. So that is where Ames is. And then I, I don't need to spend any time on this, but since most of you are computational scientists, you probably know the value of what computational simulations can do, uh, why you can't do uh, everything in wind tunnels. You know, NASA Ames has some of the largest wind tunnels. Uh, so does NASA Langley. Um, and you could also do flight tests. You can do drop tests. You can drop things off a balloon. You can do all of those things. But all of those things are either too expensive, too risky, or they cannot really mimic what a real life situation would be. So you would have computer simulations done then in addition to you know, flight tests and um, wind tunnel experiments to kind of complement and design what you want to do. Obviously, certain things, the only way to do is computation, computer simulation. Suppose you're trying to look at you know, ocean currents and, and future of uh, sea level rise and all of that. So then when we think about it, um, given that Ames is the agency's center for doing high performance computing and um, you know, I'm the manager for all of high end computing for NASA, this is where I wanted to kind of highlight also the difference between what NASA high end computing does versus what DOE would do. In DOE, high end computing is one of the major thrust areas. And so they have a lot more investment in that, but they also have a very specific goals that they want to achieve in high-end computing. For NASA, high-end computing is just an enabling technology. NASA needs high-end computing to do the other five, six, seven things that we need to do. However, we need it in-house, so we, cannot, we don't have to depend on someone else. And high-end computing per se is just an enabling technology. So if you think about it, Supercomputing obviously is the top dog and the 900 pound gorilla in this kind of thing, but there are other things that are also complement supercomputing and NASA per se doesn't really care what all those other things are as long as it gets the job done. So if quantum computing is needed or brain inspired neuromorphic computing is needed or we should go to the cloud or we are more focused on generating you know, collaborative frameworks, it's, it's not their problem. It's the problem of the high-end computing center and the facility to provide that capability to do what NASA needs. So the rest of my presentation, I'm going to talk about not all of them, but at least some of them a little bit to kind of give you an overview of where we are in most of these things, okay? Because of the time, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, like I said. So a lot of this is kind of, you know, just a teaser into what we are doing, okay? So let's talk a little bit about supercomputing since that's the biggest thing. So again, for NASA, for us, there are main, three main things. One is a large portion of our budget is focused on engineering work, getting to Mars, getting to other places in the universe. That's a big thing for NASA. So therefore, simulations running on the computers have to be able to do these engineering calculations and high throughput calculations, which you could call them capacity computing, but they're not really capacity computing in that sense, because even though each job might be running on 1,000 cores or 2,000 cores, and they are, in theory, independent of each other, I cannot make a final decision until all 10,000 runs have been done. So if I have a big computer, I'm able to run many 2,000 core jobs at the same time. And that's mainly focused for engineering work. But then I also have other work like science or aeronautics where I want to do not these kind of big throughput runs, but I want to do a capability run. I want to, do, I want to have you know, 20 grid points in the vortex core. I want to do a global ocean simulation at a hundredth of a degree resolution. So these are huge calculations that I have to push through. So anytime 
I'm having a computer at NASA, I must be able to do these both kinds of jobs. I must be able to push these big jobs through, but I also have to have these little jobs go through it at the same time. And then there is also a high availability thing. Because for NASA, like I said, there is a certain component of research that we're doing, but the main focus is to enable the NASA missions. So these computers have to be there all the time. So even though we would love to be number one on the top 500, um, we cannot take the chance of running something just to get a huge Linpack run, but I'm not exactly sure whether the computer is actually going to run my CFD code or my you know, lattice Boltzmann calculation. So this is just a quick overview. This is more like details, but this is just a quick overview of the systems that we have at NASA Ames. Uh, so obviously our main system is Pleiades. Um, you know, it's a SGI system, now HPE. Um, uh, it, I think in the latest top 500 that came out in June in Frankfurt, was ranked number 15. Uh, but we are also focused on this other system called Electra, and I'll talk a little bit about that, where we are trying to do supercomputing in a container. And then we have other systems because again, the idea is to be able to do NASA's main requirements. And so we have shared memory systems, but we also have this big hyperwall that you can see at the bottom. Uh, if you look at, and, and NASA was the first agency to actually come up with this concept. Now, obviously these are everywhere. And, but the idea is if you think about big supercomputers, big supercomputers do not have a graphical processing capability. Not that they have GPUs or not, but the fact that you cannot visualize things. And if you have really large computers and if you have exaflops computers, the amount of data that is going to come out is too large. And there has to be many ways of dealing with that output in a much more smarter fashion. If you look at all your senses, the eye is the one that is able to get in most of the information in parallel than any of your other four senses. Most of the other senses are either purely serial or maybe somewhat parallel. But the eye is the thing that can do a huge amount of parallel processing at the same time. Um, but then it's also a question of, you know, do you really want to do a simulation and then look at the data later? You have to be able to do concurrent visualization. So we had actually done the hyperwall a long time ago and right now, when it was first built, it was the highest resolution system in the world uh, at 245 million pixels. But the idea also was to have a lot of small screens because our idea was not just to do a large calculation and show a big ocean simulation, which we could do, even though those bezels bother you a little bit, but over time you ignore them. But the idea also was to be able to do engineering calculations where you can see sets of related images and see relationships among themselves, among those images. But one of the other things that we are also focused on is modular supercomputing. Now, obviously data centers are everywhere. Uh, I'm sure Google and Amazon has a lot of these things and they're doing it, but, they're, but this is not for transactions. I'm actually going to run a Navier-Stokes simulation on these kinds of things. So this is something that we have started. We already have a prototype modular supercomputing facility, which is where Electra system is actually uh, installed. The PUE, which is the power utilization efficiency, is significantly better. PUE is the total power that is required by a center divided by the total power that goes to run the system. So basically in an ideal case, it should be one, where every kilowatt of power you're using goes just to run the system, but oftentimes you will have chillers and cooling towers and other kinds of things that is used up some of the power. So the PUE is usually for most data centers 1.65 or 1.5, even at a center in our brick and mortar building, that's something like 1.25 or something. Whereas if you go into these more adiabatic containers and other things, you can actually do it much better. And given the weather in the Bay Area is perfect, um, you can do a lot of these things. But we also have the, 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 the plan and approved plan to basically go up and do this huge modular farm. Like I said, we have 1,800 acres. This is just one acre and we can put in 16 modules and that is basically on its way. So again, so that kind of gives you a sense of where we are in terms of supercomputing. Uh, but again, just running the computers itself, anyone who has a lot of money can go and buy a computer. That's not a problem. How do you actually use it? This is a kind of a busy slide, but this at least gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. If you start from the top, you have the mission challenges and they could be aeronautics, science, exploration, whatever it might be. But once those are identified, then those projects 
get support from our center and from the system itself to be able to run those, do all of the analysis, simulations, post-processing, whatever, the, and the visualization, and send it back to the, the actual domain experts and the mission directors to decide what happens after that. And, and the, the model within NASA is all of these three things at the bottom are essentially kind of free to the, the mission directorate in the sense that this has already been paid for by NASA. So as long as it's an important project and you get the appropriate prioritization, everything else is automatically covered. So at this point, I think it's obligatory to show you some images. So, so here, so I decided I'm just going to use a few samples just to give you a sense of what we're doing. So, uh, uh, so this is from aeronautics, as you can imagine. So for the first time, we, were able, we, NASA, did one of these largest simulations ever done for rotorcraft in both hover case, and where we were also capturing the, the acoustics part of it, but also in forward flight at several revolutions. And this is a couple of years, few years old, maybe three years old. But this was the first time that you could see actually the, the very complicated interactions between the wake, the vortex wake that is shed from the tip and that interacts with the trailing blade. This is one of the biggest problems of helicopters. With airplanes, you don't have this problem. With airplanes, whatever vortex comes off the, uh, the wing tip goes and bothers the next airplane, not you. <laughs> Here the problem is that the vortex is actually bothering you. Your next blade is coming and hitting the vortex that was shed by a previous flight. Um, so let's move on to science. So, so again, NASA has one of the largest repositories of uh, observational data. And again, this is freely available to anyone in the world. All you have to do is to have buy big storage. So once you ask me to send you the data, I'll send it to you. You just have to take that three petabytes of data somewhere. Uh, but it's freely available, okay? And when we used to have smaller computers, we would do regional models, but then those introduce error into the models because you're making assumptions of the, about the boundary. But now, with these kinds of simulations, you can actually do the entire globe, global ocean. This is at a 48th of a degree resolution. You cannot go much finer than this without then considering that the water is no longer homogeneous. Right now, this is, you're still assuming that the water is homogeneous or the ocean is homogeneous. But at those scales, at any finer scales, the whales are now creating problems, so you have to kind of account for them, okay? You can't just say, oh, okay, it's water everywhere. It's not really true, okay? So again, just a quick sense of that. And then, uh, um, so let's look at engineering. So this is the first 1.2 seconds of a rocket launch, okay? And so the biggest two things here is what is known as the ignition overpressure. So before the rocket actually launches, a huge plume comes out, it goes into this flame trench. We have to make sure that the plume remains in the flame trench. You have to make sure that not debris are being scattered all over the place. And you have to make sure that it does not come and affect any of the payload or anything that we have in the rocket because the rocket still hasn't kind of left the pad yet. It's just revving up to go, but it hasn't left. So it's just a few seconds. And then of course there is also the um, the acoustics part of it. So that is shown in the middle picture and that also has an overlaid, uh, overset adaptive grids on it. Um, but that is also capturing the acoustic waves and to see if that would affect any of the, um, the payload that you might have because you might have live payload also. So then let's move a little bit to the future. So this is NASA's model of the space launch system. This is the rocket that is going to take us to Mars. And one of the things here is the separation of the solid rocket boosters. And so the, these are these two boosters that have to be separated and you have to make sure that it does not come back and recontact the core stage. And so the number here at the bottom is, is the distance in feet from the solid rocket boosters away. And so here you have the SLS and at the very top of that is the MPCV where the crew is, which is called Orion. And on top of that is a launch abort system which is going to pull the crew off from the rocket 
if there is a problem on the launch pad before the rocket actually stays, takes off. So, um, so that, that gave you a little sense of that. Uh, I don't know if you want to see it one more time, but basically all the particles here are colored by age of the particle, at what point they left. There's a little bit of a, a shock wave that goes up, and then these two solid rocket boosters are getting um, detached, and, and you want to see where, if, if there's any V contact, and if there is any kind of eff effect on the, uh, on the multipurpose crew vehicle that is sitting at the top. And then finally, let me show you one last picture. This is low density supersonic decelerator. This is a huge version. So here the idea is that we are going to use atmospheric drag to slow down planetary entry. So if I'm going to land on another planet or maybe some moons of some planet, I need to slow down from this enormous speed I'm coming in. And so one idea is to use these huge parachutes um, that this one here is 60 feet in diameter. A smaller version of this, about a quarter of the size, was used to land Curiosity on Mars. This was the seven minutes of terror where it was slowed down to land gently on Mars. So this is four times bigger. Obviously, you're not going to be able to fit it into the wind tunnel. We have the world's largest wind tunnel. The test section is 80 feet by 120 feet. You can put an F-18 in there, but this, this, this parachute is not going to fit there. And it has to be supersonic. This is at 2.3 Mach, so it, can't be, so it has to be in a supersonic test tunnel. Now, you can do a flight test, which we did, and many of you know that one of the tests actually failed because the parachute kind of shredded, but you would have to basically take it to a balloon, then you have to launch it, and then you have to make sure that it gathers that kind of speed in a rarefied air, and then you have to deploy the parachute and then see if it works. And if it works, then we're going to go use it and land on some other place, millions of miles away. So obviously you have to do simulations. Okay, so, so that's all I'm going to talk about supercomputing. Let me talk a little bit about some of the other things. Uh, one of the other major things that we have is collaborative environments. So, you know, if you have a lot of data and if you have a lot of code, many people write their codes. In fact, you're supposed to get a PhD in computational science to write your own Navier-Stokes solver probably. Um, the problem then is that people have some observational data that NASA provides. You run your own code, you write a paper, and there is no way of figuring out whether what was done or anyone can actually take it beyond what was done and kind of grow that. So one idea, and this becomes particularly complicated in areas like Earth Sciences, which is more of a community effort, as opposed to building SLS. You know, not everybody is building SLS. But everybody can download some data and do modeling and figure out a whole variety of things. So we did this thing called NASA Earth Exchange, uh, which is basically takes virtual collaboration. It's a social network kind of thing. You have computing, you have repositories, so all your data is there. You captured the workflow. So anyone who uses NASA data, uses NASA code or their own code, and can post all of that into this NEX framework, and so the next person that comes along can see exactly what was done and then could further that. And in fact, there is an actually an open version of it, which is called OpenNEX, which is a partnership between NASA and Amazon Web Services, where they also provide some of this at some level without a lot of computing power. The advantage at NASA, though, is if you use, if you need something, then it allows you to go off and use NASA's computing power. Just a very quick example of all the things that have happened. You know, there was a high resolution projection for climate impact studies. We have done, you know, biomass at 100 meter resolution by looking at data from different sources. We are now using machine learning and data mining. A lot of stuff um, has been used on NEX. I don't know, it sounds very nice to have endless summer, especially if you're in Chicago, but, uh, or not, I don't know. But again, there are a lot of research that was done based on uh, work that was done on NEX. And then let me talk a little bit about this other area because this is again a big area um, for uh, the federal government and maybe for the all of computing capability. If you look at where classical computing is and if Intel is making seven nanometer chips, you know, you can only go down so far, right? You're basically there, there. And, and even at seven nanometers or four nanometers, um, quantum effects are going on, right? If the if the transistor is that tiny, 
there's got to be quantum effects going on. You're just ignoring those. But any smaller scale, you know, quantum is going to dominate that. And so, you know, this is just a very quick primer on that because this is something that we are also heavily interested in. I know that DOE is looking at that as well. But, you know, quantum mechanics basically is dealing with physical phenomena that are at very small scales and at very low temperatures, okay? So that part, everybody understands. Uh, quantum mechanics and quantum physics is an established thing. It's a science, not an art. Everybody gets that. Um, but there are some weirdness about quantum that makes it powerful but also challenging. And so one of the things, of course, is that any observation changes the measurement. This doesn't happen in classical physics. If I measure the density of a liquid or if I measure the velocity of a car, the fact that I actually measured it does not change the value. In quantum, that's not true. Anytime you measure, anytime you observe something, the measurement has changed. So that's a problem. Um, but it also has, you know, very powerful capabilities. For example, the fundamental, if you think about quantum computing, not just about quantum physics, uh, the fundamental uh, unit in quantum computing is known as this qubit. And it can be zero and one at the same time and all complex combinations. And that is because, you know, quantum allows you to be in multiple states at the same time. Uh, it is a very powerful tool because it can do tunneling. And so therefore, if you want to find a global minimum anywhere, a classical method would have to jump over the hill to get to the global minimum. Quantum, obviously I'm, you know, over, I'm just, you know, giving a much broad brush of the whole thing. Obviously it's not true at every scale, but quantum is able to do tunneling, so it can do those kinds of things. And then quantum has this really weird feature called entanglement, where two atoms are entangled in the sense that one atom knows the state of the other atom independent of how far those atoms are. And this is independent of the speed of light. So the two atoms can be at two ends of the universe. If this atom changes spin, this atom knows it immediately, okay? So, so there are all these powerful things. The challenge always has been, can you do quantum computing? Can you get these qubits to a certain point that you can actually do something useful? Because in theory, it all sounds good. One or two qubits is not really helpful. You need a bunch of qubits. And then the biggest problem, like I said, Anytime you have a quantum computer, if you, want to, if you want to get a result, that means you force the quantum computer to come to a classical state. And so therefore all the qubits have to kind of sit, flip to either a zero or a one. Because a quantum, a qubit can be zero and one at the same time as long as you're not reading it. As soon as you read it, it has to be a zero or a one because it can be zero and one at the same time in classical physics. And so therefore, because also the, un, the uncertainty principle Sometimes the same qubit will give you a zero and sometimes it'll give you a one. So in theory, this is a really bad situation, right? I have a computer, I've put in a lot of input, I let it run for a long time, and every time I read it, it gives me something, okay? But that's what we are going to figure this out. And there's been a lot of ways of doing this. You know, there have been trapped ions, neutral atoms, people have used photons as quantum, anything. Basically, the fundamental thing is you need something that can be at two states at the same time. That's all you need, that's the qubit. How many more qubits you can get and get them all to play together to solve a problem, that's a challenge. But to get a certain entity that can be in two states at the same time is a qubit. And that, many people know how to do it. They, this is all over the world. People have done all kinds of things. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what we are doing. But why is NASA interested in quantum? Apart from the theoretical thing that we, we need to go beyond Moore's law and we are looking at either quantum computing or we are looking at neuromorphic computing because those are the only two options left as far as we know at this time. But why is NASA interested? So NASA has been doing supercomputing for a long time, just like everyone else, but there are a lot of applications that are uh, exponential in complexity. So these are problems that are of the complexity two raised to the power n, where n is the number of unknowns. When you're doing any other kind of computational science, those are all quadratic or cubic. They could be n square, n log n, n cubed, n square over log n, some variety of that. But these problems are all of the complexity two to the n, so that when n grows, these are unsolvable problems. So right now we solve all of these problems. For example, just scheduling jobs on a supercomputer is an NP-hard problem, right? But, but are we not scheduling jobs on a supercomputer? Of course. So how are we doing it? We're just using heuristics. It's the same for everything else, right? Air traffic management. 
completely NP hard problem, right? But are planes not flying and are we not controlling how many, but are they flying optimally? No. And the question is, do you need to fly them optimally or not? That's a debatable thing. But the point is that these are not optimal solutions. And, 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 and that's true for a variety of these things. So, so what we do at, at Ames is we have this system which is, which is basically doing this thing called quantum annealing. So it's not a universal quantum computer. It does what is known as annealing, which is very similar to simulated annealing. So the idea is in, in it only solves one equation, and the idea is that you need quantum fluctuations for the system to get to the lowest energy, to, to get to the global minimum as, and maintaining the lowest energy state at all times. So what you do in simulated annealing is you basically use thermal fluctuations. You are basically, in some sense, um, moving a ball or you know, shaking it, hoping that the ball will get to the lowest point. That's how it does. And as in the process of shaking the ball, the ball might sometimes jump over a hill and fall into a lower space. That's what you're doing in simulated engineering. So you're using thermal fluctuations. Here you're doing quantum fluctuations to, let, to get you to the lowest possible state. And so the system that we have is this D-wave system. Many of you may have heard about it. So here, this uses superconducting qubits. So what they've done is they've taken a metal called niobium. So it's like that. It's a metal like niobium. You make it into a tiny loop, and you cool it enough, and you have to cool it to 20 millikelvin or lower. That's a really low temperature. And when we first got this, I thought that was the biggest challenge. Apparently, that's not a big challenge. You know, this is 300 Kelvin, interstellar space is 3 Kelvin, this is 20 millikelvin, but apparently that can be done easily. Okay, I guess I didn't know that. But, um, but once you get that metal down to that temperature, then electrons flow in both clockwise and anticlockwise direction. And so therefore, from your college physics days, it has both an up and a down magnetic field. So that's your qubit, it's a very simple thing. I make a little loop, cool it down, and I have both up and down magnetic field at the same time. That's my qubit. And so then I can take the qubit, and I can form these little, Unit cells, those go in there. Right now we have a 2031, I believe. Uh, yeah, 2031 bit D-wave system. That little thing over there, which is the chip, the good thing is if you have a lot more money, you cannot buy two of these and connect them up. You have to take the chip out and replace it with a bigger chip. Not like supercomputing, I just buy 10 racks today, and tomorrow my program manager sends me more money, I buy another 10 racks and add it, it's not going to work. And then that whole thing sits on at the bottom of that upside down wedding cake, which basically uses liquid helium to take the temperature down from room temperature to 20 millikelvin or lower. We run it at 15 millikelvin. The whole thing then sits inside the Faraday cage because it has to be uh, shielded from the Earth's magnetic field because any warming would take it out of the quantumness. And then that whole thing, because we are in earthquake country, sits on a special foundation that is basically decoupled from the entire building. So if there is an earthquake, the building will be fine, but the system might get obliterated. Uh, so because I don't want any transient vibrations as well. And all it does, it takes in a bunch of zeros and ones, and it gives you a bunch of zeros and ones, except that even though you give the same zeros and ones in, you'll get a different set of zeros and ones each time. And so this is what the problem does. The problem only solves what is known as a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. So every problem has to be in this form. So if you had a form, if you had a, if you had in your problem definition a term like alpha i j k z i z j z k, you cannot solve that problem. But we know how to do that. That part is known as mapping the problem. So if you have a term like alpha i j k z i z j z k, we all know from smart mathematics that you can convert it into that form over there, where every term is only two terms. It either has y or z or something. There's not no multipliers in there. So once you get it in that form. That's the mapping part that can be done independent of the system. And then you have to embed that problem into the system. The system itself is a chimera graph. So it's a bipartite graph of, made up of unit cells. Each unit cell has eight qubits. And so there are four qubits on the left, four qubits on the right. Qubits on the left are connected to all the four qubits on the right, vice versa. And then every qubit in a unit cell is connected to two other qubits in some other unit cell. So every vertex there has a degree six. So as you can see, already you have a problem, because if you have a pr problem where after you've done all your mathematical jugglery, you have a term which requires a degree seven, then that cannot be embedded in there. That cannot be mapped in there, because the maximum degree there is six. So that means you have to dilate the graph, so there has to be multiple qubits there, 
in the, in the middle picture that represents the same vertex here. And then those two qubits have to have a ferromagnetic connection because those two qubits logically are the same vertex here. So if that qubit in this complex zero one feel is pointing in a certain direction, the other qubit has to be exactly like that because they are theoretically the same vertex on your problem. If they're not, if they're slightly aligned, then you're solving a different problem. And then after all of that, then you're going to run this problem and you're going to get different results every time. And at some point, you have to decide that you've run the problem long enough and you can take the answer. And so the example I give people all the time, you can take a US quarter and you can flip it a million times. And there is a reasonable non-zero probability that all million times it gave you heads. It would be perfectly fine to assume therefore that the US quarter has heads on both sides because you flipped it a million times. What you didn't know that the next billion times it would have given you tails. But you didn't know that, but you did the experiment a million times. That's a long experiment. And that's exactly what we do. So every run on the D-Wave system is known as an annealing time. We usually take 20 microseconds. So whatever you run on the system only takes 20 microseconds to run. And so we typically run a million times of any calculation. And then after that, you decide whether it's good enough or not. And if you not, then you run it another million times. Uh, so here are some examples. We are doing a lot of stuff on complex planning and scheduling, for example. You know, if you want to plan how the rover should move from point A to point B on Mars and always remains in the sunlight, does good waypoints, doesn't fall down into a deep sleep, uh, a, a, a steep slope so it cannot get out, all of those things. If you're trying to schedule astronaut time on the station, which is always a complex thing, you know, you don't want two astronauts to reach for the same hammer because I have only one hammer at the same time. Again, that's a hard problem. Um, the second here is looking at uh, fault detection. So if I have a set of inputs and I have a set of outputs and I see my, out and I know what the output should be based on the inputs I gave and the output is not the same, how do I know where the error is? What is the minimum number of errors? And so here's a very simple thing, but we are now applying this to AND gates and NOT gates and adders. So suppose I have a complex adder and I give it an input and I get an output and I know that the output is wrong. Anything in that whole circuit could be wrong. But what is the minimum number of faults in the system that could have given me the wrong answer? So I want to start from there and then I can go instead of looking, up, uh, looking at every possible solution. Graph isomorphism obviously is a known problem. Um, but there are also areas in, this is kind of computer science, but there's also physics. So for example, all the qubits are not exactly the same. They, they all have a little noise around them. It's not like Intel chips that every chip and every bit is exactly the same. Every qubit is kind of his own little personality. So, so what do we, what, how do we do about that? What about noise, for example? You know, if you don't have, you're not going to buy a processor that does not have error correcting bits. Well, you don't have error correcting qubits now. And right now, the, the, the best that we know is that you need many more error correcting bits to correct one qubit. It's the other way around in classical. You have a lot of bits and you need one extra bit to do the correction. Here it's almost the other way. You have some bit, qubits, and you need a large number of qubits to correct those qubits. It's just not scalable. And then of course, the how do you even, like I said, how do you actually embed a problem? So if you have a graph representation of your problem and the degree of one of the vertices is larger than six, then you have to dilate that graph and map and, and embed it. But how do you embed it? So for example, if three qubits make up one logical vertex, where are these three qubits? Should you take the three qubits that are in the same unit cell or should you go to the next unit cell or which unit cell do you go? So you don't know that. So anyway, so that kind of brings me to the end of my talk. So the idea is for, for, from a NASA perspective, if you look at all the things that we do, you know, looking for Earth-like planets, looking at aeronautics research, hurricane prediction, looking at the next generation of rockets, launch complex, space launch system, looking at the formation of the universe. Um, what we are interested in is providing kind of stable production level high performance computing, but also looking at advanced technologies that, that get us there. And you know, finally, this is where we want to go, right? So right now, we are Earth reliant. We know exactly what to do. You know, this is where things like autonomy and all of that has to come. Here I can call up and say, Houston, I have a problem. It's not going to work. 
Uh, by the time Houston has a problem and Houston fixes all that, the problem is just gone out of control. So it's not gonna work. So right now we are Earth reliant, we know how to do that. We have a lot of stuff that we can do in low Earth orbit, station basically is Earth reliant. You know, you can call up station, you can ground call up anytime. You have done more moon, but can you go beyond places, things that are going to be Earth independent? It's going to be several years for a mission. Um, the return could be months. How are you gonna do all of that? So anyway, that's all I have. Um, happy to take any questions or any comments anyone might have. Thanks again for your attention. Questions? It was an amazing talk. <laughs> the question here, yeah. What, what kind of queue times do you have on your HPC systems? So we are going to get into the practicals right from the start, okay. So, so like I said, um, the NASA systems are focused on, on doing NASA work. It doesn't have to be NASA people per se, but either NASA, NASA researchers or people we have collaborations on. And as I said, you can never provide enough computing because the scientists and engineers always have grand ideas. So even if I have 10 exaflops machines, it's just going to be filled up. That's, so, so that's a good question. And so it, the way it works is that you have to, you as a researcher or, uh, or whoever wants ex access to the system, have, must have enough priority in, from your program manager that would then, so I would say that there are certain jobs that will get submitted and run immediately. There are certain jobs that will get submitted and run maybe after two days or three days. But there are also certain jobs that will never really run. <laughs> They're just going to sit there because everyone else is coming after them and for some reason they have high priority. They may run someday, but I'm just saying it's an exaggeration. But the idea is that, you know, so there are special cues. For example, you know, if we have a mission or if we have something else, there are special cues. So those jobs are coming in and bypassing everyone else and going through. And then there could be jobs that are waiting for days. Now, again, since you're talking about scheduling, talking about quantum, this is like an end. So people also know how to play games, right? If you submit a job for one hour, but if I submit it for 59 minutes, it might go through because there is some caveat, right? Because <laughs> it's a game, it's a gaming game theory, right? You are playing a game against something else. It's just like when you go to a supermarket, right? Which, which checkout counter do you stand, right? This is a short line, but you know, this is an older woman going to fiddle with her <laughs> credit card, and this is a longer line, but these young girls standing here, they're going to zoom through, I'm going to stand here. <laughs> but, yeah. Any other questions? I have one. <laughs> okay. So, what is the challenge, the real, or the several challenges for Mars, for the missions to Mars? Well, okay, so basically, there are, you would consider that there are, there is fundamentally one main challenge. Because we know how to go to Mars, right? You know, we landed Curiosity on Mars, so we can get to Mars, so it's, no, that's <laughs> not the issue. We know the technology, how to get there. We have put things on Mars, so yeah, taking a human there is a little bit more complicated, but we can do it. The problem is, what is going to be the condition of the human when he or she gets there, right? That's the problem, see, because we know that. Even when we, and hopefully all of you are doing this, when you sit in front of a computer for four hours, then sometimes you can't get up, your back hurts, and this and that. So someone is going to be put in a little Volkswagen Golf or even smaller than that, and we are going to send him or her for three, month, three years, or, or maybe due to some technology we can get them in a year. That's still a long time. So, so the problem is that how are we going to have a capable human being there after such a long duration flight? So I think that's the biggest challenge. So there are tricks to kind of shorten the trip, but the question also is how do you keep your muscles from getting atrophied and everything else, and that you may not even go mad or something being in this small place for such a long flight. I think that's the biggest challenge. The technology is there, we can make the technology better, we can look at the alignment of Earth and Mars and everything else and the other planets to do kind of slingshots and everything else to get there faster, but you're still not going to get there in like two days.
a question, yeah. I know at um, the DOE labs, you can apply for uh, compute time mm -hmm. through the inside or the ALCC. Yeah. Is there something similar at um, for anyone to apply to? Uh, not really. I think the way it works for NASA, like I said, the main thing is because the focus is on NASA missions. So if you are at a DOE lab or even at a university, but you are already working on a NASA project, let's say you already you submitted a grant proposal to NASA for doing something, let's say, you know, maybe aeronautics research or something, or you know, then as part of that, then you can get an account. But because we are so oversubscribed, just like everyone else, and because our mission is not particularly on that. We do not take applications from universities or anyone, any other place to just give out time. So that is not possible. But anyone, if you are, if you, so if you're a university and your professor got a grant from NASA to do some work, well, then as part of that work, if they needed some access to the supercomputers, absolutely you'll get that. So as you said that uh, NASA has practically outsourced travels to the ISS or near orbit space missions. What is the fundamental difference in not outsourcing the HPC environment and all that as well? Sure, and so we always, so we look at that. So that is, so that's a very good question and we look at that all the time. So the question is, you know, should you outsource everything? Should you outsource maybe the small jobs? Should you outsource the jobs that are not that critical? Yeah, so we do that. It's the same question that almost any supercomputing facility could be asked, right? If this is the same question that could be asked of DOE, DOD, NSF, NASA. Yes, that's a very valid question and we constantly monitor that because in some sense, we are already running it as a cloud, but we are running it as our own private cloud. So NASA is running a system at Ames that is open to all NASA people and NASA partners anywhere on, in the world. So it is a cloud, but it's a private cloud. And the question is, do I even need to do that? Can I even say, okay, you know, Amazon or Google or Microsoft just run the system? Sure, yeah, but we have to look at that and we have to see what the pros and cons are. And you know, like I said, ultimately at the end of the day, there are two things that are important. One is, you know, the cost of doing that, um, the cost of networking and storage. You still have to provide the kind of a um, value added user services. And, and the question also is, and we have had these discussions with vendors, if you have constant requirement all the time, then it's not clear whether it's the best thing to do. It's just like, should you buy or rent a car? If you are going to drive the car every day, you probably should buy the car. If on the other hand, if I'm coming to Chicago to give this talk and flying back tomorrow, I probably should not buy a car here, <laughs> right? So if you have surge requirements that on certain days or certain parts of the year, your surge goes, you should probably not buy a computer just to do that surge. You should probably go to the cloud. But if you need all the time, you know, we, we went and talked to IBM and Cray about this. They said, sure. How much computing do you need? Oh, I need, you know, 10,000 cores every day for the rest of my life. Sure. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a system for you, and instead of putting it in NASA, I'll put it in my site, because you need 10,000 every day. So I have to just go buy a 10,000 core system for you. So it's the same price. You buy it or we buy it, it's the same thing. You, someone has to buy the hardware. It's only when you have, oh, some days I might need 10,000, some day I might need 2,000. Okay, then the question comes, okay, I might be able to get away with buying something and I'm going to timeshare it or you know, do something and meet everyone. I think there was, a, there was a question there and then we'll get back to you. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, so one's not related to HPC. Um, but first of all, I thought those animations were really impressive. Um, and my question is, so are you doing the animations in the post-processing or during? It's a mix of both. So a lot of the animations are done during the computations. Because like I said earlier, in fact, that was the reason for the hyperwall. And maybe I should have been a little bit clearer also. The hyperwall comes across as a big screen. Okay, you go to Times Square, you can see big hyperwalls. That's not a big deal. You know, it's everywhere, everyone has that. But the main thing is the engine behind the hyperwall. 
So the rendering engine that is sitting behind the hyperwall and is connected through InfiniBand directly to the supercomputer, so as your Navier-Stokes solver or whatever CFD or whatever calculation you're doing, if every time step you're doing, the renderer is doing the rendering. It may not display, that's a different. When we talk about the hyperwall, there are basically two parts. One is the display and one is the rendering. So it does the rendering in real time with a one or two um, time step lag. Maybe it's doing every five time steps because it doesn't need to do that. That's the important thing. Because what I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to dump everything down because then I'll need a lot of storage. Then I have to read everything back in. And then, like most of us are researchers, so I'm sure we made a stupid mistake somewhere. So everything has to be thrown away because my you know, time step was wrong or I, you know, violated the current condition or the CFL number, so something is wrong. So I have to redo the whole thing, and now I ran and wasted everything. So, so exactly. So a lot of the, what you're seeing is done in, like many of the helicopter rotations, that, that's three petabytes of data. You're not going to write three petabytes of data and read it in. It's just not going to happen. You have to do it right there. Or, or some of the ocean simulations. You're, you're, that's, a, that's, you know, that's four billion grid points. So you're not going to do that. But a lot of those, yes, it's a combination. Okay, um, and I thought that the helicopter problem was interesting. Uh, can you talk more about like maybe solutions that you had? Like, could you put uh, like a dip in the blade or some, something like that? I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, we can talk about that. There's been, so helicopter research is a major challenging area in aeronautics. There's a lot of work being done, for example, you know, there's been a lot of work done also on the materials aspect so that when the helicopter blade goes in the, in the, in the direction that is actually giving you lift and forward push, on the other hand, when it goes round, can I actually change the shape of the blade, mm. right? So can I do some things in the material so that, remember, if you're doing a 1600 RPM, the blade has to change shape every 1600 times. So when you're going, I wanted like a beautiful blade, which is cutting through the air, giving me the lift, no drag, all of that. But on the other hand, I have to just basically make it disappear. <laughs> basically, it should not be there. It should just vanish on the other side. Well, that's not simple, right? So, so a lot of people, a lot of things have been done. Also, you know, the helicopter blades have a lot of, um, you know, uh, structural characteristics to it also. So because the blades, if you look at helicopters, when they're just sitting on the tarmac, their blades kind of droop. You know, airplanes' blades or wings don't really droop, per se. But so there's a lot of work has been done. So that's a huge research area to see how to make the blades disappear on, 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 the, back, on the back side. But that also creates all these problems with helicopters. But also remember, the, the problem with the helicopters, because you know, the blades are moving in only one direction, it's already creating a little bit of a asymmetry, right? Because the blades are, so the, so the helicopter has a tendency to go in one direction because it's like a fan blade, right? Now, you, so obviously people have tilt rotors, you have two blades, you know, that's why you need to also have the rear blade. So there's all kinds of other things that makes it, but that also, Helicopters are very powerful, so therefore they can stay in hover. Not aeroplanes, you can just stand here in the middle of nowhere, but a helicopter could. But it also makes it easy to detect helicopters because of the blade vortex interaction and this high-speed impulsive noise that, that therefore you can detect helicopters from large distances. Uh, so, so from some of the, uh, the application domains you showed, it's clear that you're using you know, uh, CFD heavily, uh, maybe large eddy simulations, BHR, and, um, and maybe even DNS for some of the turbulence work. But um, my question is, uh, how much are you, are you um, maybe not a dollar number, but are you in investing in the development of those core capabilities? And are you uh, actually doing research in new techniques in those areas? Um, um, or is it uh, more the application of those technologies? And are you, you a follow-up question would be, are you using in-house developed or third-party developed tools? Okay, so let me start with the, uh, the last question. These are all, most of the codes that all the applications that you're seeing here are all in-house developed. Um, and, um, and in fact, we have one of the students here, Eric Nielsen, who can tell you more about it, but he also, he's from NASA Langley. 
Um, so a lot of this is in-house developed. And so therefore, at some point in the past, we had done a lot of research to actually develop these things. And so to getting, getting back to your, you know, kind of your first question or middle question, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, we are probably not doing enough research. We should probably do perhaps more, especially in DNS and LES and those kinds of things. A lot of the things that you're still seeing here is still kind of a, minor changes and upgrades to what we have developed over the years. But yes, so, so yes, we do need to do a lot more research. We are doing research. In fact, the aeronautics research mission directorate, if you look, go back to the first, second slide, um, all of the mission directors, if you look at the name, science mission directorate and space technology and human exploration and operations, but aeronautics is aeronautics research mission directorate. So aeronautics is focused on research, and they have, they have a lot of plans on Vision 2030 and CFD 2030, so they have a lot of really gr grand plans to really advance the state of the art, because we all know that when we get to exaflops or beyond, to actually get you know, six orders of magnitude improvement in performance, you know, hardware will probably give you two orders. You know, Moore's law freely gives you something, but you know, these algorithms and applications that will also be critical to get where you need to. So, yes. Any other question? There's a question right here in the front. I always get nervous when you give public <laughs> um, so, so, you said you do collaborations with SpaceX. How how has you know SpaceX being the first private company being able to send out a spaceship and everything affected the way NASA handles or has it changed any like any like how you guys develop your own applications and do you guys do because I know SpaceX also wants to like go to Mars and has like a similar mission do you guys do collaborations with them as well? Right. Okay. Well, so yeah, let's let's separate those two things out. Um, so the first part is NASA made a decision a few years ago that especially servicing the station and those things we are going to hand over to the commercial sector because those things we believe we have already done, the hard problems are done, we probably need to focus and because of limited budgets and resources, we need to focus on bigger problems like maybe cislunar, maybe deep space and so therefore shuttling crew and cargo back and forth the station we can give to someone else. And you know, SpaceX won that, and you know, you have Orbital, ATK, Boeing, they have all, of, none of them have so far actually transported cargo, uh, transported crew. In fact, we just transported one on Soyuz. But, but we believe that they can get there. But as part of that, this is the agreement that we have, as part of that, anything that these companies need that we already know, is freely available to them, okay? So if they have a question about logistics, question about design, all of that is freely available. But that's the commercial crew and cargo to low Earth orbit. Now, if a company like SpaceX or Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, absolutely. It's the government, in principle, is not competing with anyone. If you or any company or anyone else has a better idea, Go for it. So, so there is no conflict there. Um, so it's, 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 it's just that we are focused on certain things uh, and some other things that we think can be done. You know, ultimately at the end of the day, the government is not that efficient. Let's just be honest about it, right? <laughs> so, so the commercial companies are going to be more efficient. They can also take much more risk, right? As opposed to the government. Uh, so they can do certain things better, faster, more efficiently than us, whereas we may want to focus on the harder problem. But if someone, because of their own personal interest or because of their own vision, they think that they can also solve those big problems, sure, why not? So let's thank our speaker. Okay, anyway, thanks a lot. I have, I have one, one, one uh, minor comment. Uh, Chaos theory tells us that uh, I believe a butterfly in Hong Kong can affect the weather here. So sure. I think you might want to reconsider the advection of whales. Yeah. <laughs> Good point.